years the storm is coming fast the day will soon be here when those who are caught unprepared will be the first to fall that much is clear hello and welcome to physical attraction the tale to wow key specials but we'll be examining the end of the world one apocalypse at a time and survive while there's people crying, people dying everywhere around. On September 26th, 1983, a man named Stanislav Petrov saved the world. This was the height of the Cold War, and every little diplomatic or military incident that occurred would lead to fevered speculation about the intentions of the global superpowers. The Cold War was a game of chess except both players had hand grenades, fighting and struggling for slight strategic and tactical advances, even as both sides had the power to utterly annihilate each other. At any moment of any day, hundreds of nuclear missiles were on hair-trigger alert, aimed at the major cities of the opposition. One wrong move, one false step, and millions of people would die in hours. Never before in the field of human history had so much rested on the decisions made by so few. As part of the chess game, it was necessary for the two leaders opposing each other to be utterly inscrutable. For the nuclear deterrent to truly be effective, both sides would have to believe that the other was capable of ordering an all-out thermonuclear war. It's easy to remember, if, like me, you have Western bias, the Soviets being portrayed as a vast machine unfeeling, cold, uncaring. But equally, the propaganda in the Soviet Union showed the Americans to be irrational and hate-filled just as much. Ronald Reagan was president at the time, and he was testing out his psychological operations. US warplanes flew provocatively to the brink of Soviet airspace and turned back only at the last moment. The aim was to test out the Soviet radar capability and exert psychological pressure on the USSR. Yuri Andropov, the ageing, paranoid leader of the Soviet Union, was deeply concerned as Reagan began a military build-up. The Strategic Defence Initiative, nicknamed Star Wars, was Reagan's planned space-based missile shield, and Andropov was worried that if it was deployed, it would violate the doctrine of mutually assured destruction that had kept both sides safe. After all, why would you need a space-based missile shield? unless you were planning a first strike. To make matters worse, just three weeks before, the Soviets had shot down a passenger airliner with a US congressman on board, killing 269 people, many of them Americans, who had strayed into Soviet airspace by mistake. Quoting Cold War security expert Bruce Blair, quote, Relations between the great powers had deteriorated to the point where the Soviet Union as a system, not just the Kremlin, Not just Soviet leader Andropov, not just the KGB, but as a system, was geared to expect an attack and to retaliate very quickly to it. It was on hair-trigger alert. It was very nervous and prone to mistakes and accidents. The Russians were truly convinced that the US was planning a first strike that might attempt to destroy Soviet nuclear capabilities as well as their civilian populations. It was in this febrile atmosphere that Stanislav Petrov, a lieutenant colonel for the Soviets, was on duty at his post. He was monitoring OKO, the Soviet satellite early warning system. His job was simple. He was to warn the Soviet military authorities if there were any incoming US missiles. The response would be a massive retaliatory strike as soon as the warning was detected, as the doctrine of mutually assured destruction insisted. Once the missiles were in the air, the Soviets would have minutes, not hours, to respond. Shortly after midnight, the unthinkable happened. A US missile showed up on the screen. The day that Petrov and his comrades had hoped would never arrive was here. All-out nuclear war was about to begin. Moscow, New York, Kiev, Los Angeles, the towers of Leningrad St. Petersburg and the White House in Washington, D.C., Big Ben and the Houses of Parliament in London and the city of Warsaw in Poland, the city that even the Nazi SS could not completely destroy. All of these places would be burned, vaporised, filled with the screams of the dead, dying and those condemned by radiation poisoning. 
and then, after the fires had burned, a terrible silence would fall. It was down to Petrov. He had to tell his commanders. He had to give the order. This is what he said of that night. Quote, the siren howled, but I just sat there for a few seconds, staring at the big, backlit red screen with the word LAUNCH on it, he says. The system was telling him that the level of reliability of that alert was highest. There could be no doubt. America had launched the missile. A minute later, the siren went off again. The second missile was launched. Then the third, and the fourth, and the fifth. Computers changed their alerts from LAUNCH to missile strike. If that night Petrov had followed protocol, you would not be listening to this right now. But instead, he hesitated. The computerised warning system was new, and in those days people had less blind faith in computers than they do now. Nowadays you can imagine that maybe people would even be willing to turn over the whole system to computers, but uh, in those days people weren't so sure. Petrov noticed that there were no supporting signals on the radar that confirmed the missiles had been launched. Although, waiting for those was risky. It might prevent the USSR from launching its retaliation strike. With only three or four minutes before the missiles hit, how would Petrov know if there was a false alarm or not? But something else didn't make sense to him. What was the logic in launching just one missile, or even five? They were expecting the attack to come, but they were expecting it to be all out. There's no halfway house in nuclear war. If you're going to strike, you have to be sure that you can destroy the enemy's capability to retaliate utterly, and that would require firing hundreds of missiles. They were expecting the attack to come, but they were expecting it to be all out. But perhaps this was merely the first wave of missiles, or a decapitation threat aimed to destroy the Soviet leadership while leaving the population alive. The decision that Petrov took in the next few minutes, with sirens screaming and the threat of total annihilation looming, was arguably one of the most important decisions taken in the history of mankind. He decided that it was a false alarm, and reported a systems malfunction to his high command rather than a missile strike. The next few minutes were the longest of Petrov's life. If he was wrong, the first nuclear warheads would explode over the cities of his countrymen in minutes. But he called it right. It was a false alarm. Stanislav Petrov had just saved the world. He was not rewarded. Petrov later said that the incident exposed embarrassing failures in the missile defence system. And it very nearly did cause the end of civilization as we know it, which is a pretty big embarrassing failure. So rewarding Petrov would have meant punishing his superiors for the lapses. Instead, the Soviets buried the story. He retired from the military and lived on his pension. His story didn't come out for another ten years until after the collapse of the Soviet Union. He said that even his wife didn't know until the news became public, that her husband was all that had stood between the world and global thermonuclear war. He's still alive today. If you ever happen to see him in Russia, I suggest you buy him a drink. Petrov's story is incredible. It's also not unique. It is this, and incidents like this, that make nuclear weapons my number one apocalypse in these Teotihuacan specials. More than anything else, more than the natural disasters, more than the unlikely meteorite strikes from outer space, more than the as yet unproven threats from biotechnology and artificial intelligence, nuclear weapons still terrify me. Now, you may very well believe that no rational human beings would ever order a nuclear strike. You may believe this even as you see, in the heightened tensions over North Korea, thousands of civilians petitioning the government to order a nuclear strike. You may well believe in what you called the Pax Atomica, the atomic peace. Since any nuclear armed power using nuclear weapons guarantees their own annihilation, surely no commander would ever order their use. The terrifying truth, though, is that no one has to intentionally order the use of nuclear weapons as a first strike. If it happens, it's just as likely to happen by accident, through miscommunications, misunderstandings, the law of averages, and the law of large numbers. Once the missiles have been launched, you have four minutes to make a decision. Plenty of time to make a mistake. Not enough time to be sure that you're right. The experts in this field don't just believe that some kind of nuclear error is likely eventually. 
they think that it's a miracle that it hasn't occurred already. If only Petrov's was the only story. January 24th, 1961. A B-52 bomber is flying over North Carolina, carrying its nuclear cargo. The nuclear weapons of the time worked like this. There was a ring of conventional explosives surrounding the nuclear payload. When the conventional explosions detonated, they'd compress the nuclear material, which would then go supercritical and explode with the force of 4 million tonnes of TNT. The B-52 was carrying two of these bombs, each of them 200 times more powerful than the bomb that had been dropped on Nagasaki in 1945. It was during a routine mid-air refuelling that the crew realised there was a fuel leak in the wing. Initially, they hoped to make an emergency landing, but it soon became clear that this wasn't going to be possible. They couldn't dump fuel from the other wing, and so the plane was dangerously unbalanced, heading into a fatal tailspin. Major Tulloch, in charge of those on board, ordered his crew to bail out. Three of them were killed in the process, but the worst was yet to come. As the tailspin progressed, centrifugal forces in the cockpit pulled at a small lanyard. This was attached to the bomb release mechanism. The forces of the crash and the tailspin had some effects on the bomb itself. Its arming wires were removed. As far as the bomb was concerned, it was being dropped on a legitimate target. Nuclear bombs of that era did have some safety devices. One example was a barometric, pressure-activated switch that ensured that it burst at the right height. As the bomb fell from the plane, the barometric switches were triggered. The bomb also contained a backup. If it hit the ground to ensure detonation, there were crystals that were piezoelectric. That means that when you apply pressure to them, they produce a current. And when they had the pressure of dropping onto the ground, they'd send a firing signal. The bomb smashed into the ground in North Carolina. The crystals were crushed and they released their firing signal. On one of the bombs, only the arm safe switch, one out of four safety switches, had prevented the detonation from taking place. On the other bomb. Well, Lieutenant Jack Ravel, who was in charge of bomb disposal for these devices, can tell you that story. He said, quote, Until my death, I will never forget hearing my sergeant say, Lieutenant, we found the arm safe switch. And I said, great. He said, not great. It's on arm. The US military had accidentally dropped two nuclear bombs on North Carolina. On one of them, only a single electric switch had stood between that device and the explosion. On the other, that switch had been thrown by mistake. Only in 2013 did freedom of information requests allow us to realise how close the bombs were to exploding and raining deadly fallout over the continental United States. If the bombs had detonated, Strong winds would have swept deadly radioactive fallout into New York, Washington DC, Philadelphia and Baltimore. And that's assuming that the US Nuclear Command didn't think that they were being attacked and retaliate. Human beings forget things incredibly easily. I'm young enough that the USSR had already collapsed by the time I was born. And because of that, people felt that the threat of nuclear war had receded. Even talking about it somehow seems anachronistic, a Cold War throwback. We have lived for just 20 odd years with this reduced level of threat. History doesn't end, it goes on and on and on, and accidents as we've seen will happen, especially as systems grow more and more complicated, and people grow less and less alert to the real threat. But just a few years ago, children in schools were being taught how to duck and cover under desks in case of a nuclear attack. Not that it would necessarily save you. We don't know what a modern thermonuclear war would look like. But the warheads of today are hundreds of times more powerful than the ones that devastated the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. And the accounts from those bombings are horrifying beyond belief by themselves. Dr. Michihiko Hachiya of Hiroshima survived the nuclear bombing. And here's what he said. Quote, I tried. It was all a nightmare. My wounds, the darkness, the road ahead. My movements were ever so slow. Only my mind was running at top speed. In time, I came to an open space where the houses had been removed to make a fire lane. 
Through the dim light, I could make out ahead of me the hazy outlines of the communications bureau's big concrete building, and beyond it the hospital. My spirits rose, because I knew that now someone would find me, and if I should die, at least my body would be found. I paused to rest, and gradually the things around me came into focus. There were the shadowy forms of people, some of whom looked like walking ghosts. Others moved as though in pain, like scarecrows, their arms held out from their bodies with forearms and hands dangling. These people puzzled me until I suddenly realised that they had been burned, and they were holding their arms out to prevent the painful friction of raw surfaces rubbing together. A naked woman, carrying a naked baby, came into view. I averted my gaze. Perhaps they'd been in the bath. But then I saw a naked man, and it occurred to me that, like myself, some strange thing had deprived them of their clothes. An old woman lay near me with an expression of suffering on her face, but she made no sound. Indeed, one thing was common to everyone I saw. Complete silence. Setsuko Thurlow was only a child when the bomb was dropped. She said, quote, On August 6th, 1945, I was a 13-year-old grade 8 student at Hiroshima Jogakun and a member of the Student Mobilisation Programme. I was one of a group of 30 students assigned to help at the army headquarters. We were on the second floor of the wooden building, about a mile from the hippo centre, that is the centre of the nuclear explosion, about to start our first day of work. At 8.15am, I saw a bluish-white flash like a magnesium flare outside the window. I remember the sensation of floating in the air. As I regained consciousness in the total silence and darkness, I realised I was pinned in the ruins of the collapsed building. I could not move. I knew I was faced with death. Strangely, the feeling I had was not panic, but serenity. Gradually, I began to hear my classmates' faint cries for help. Mother, help me. God, help me. Then suddenly, I felt hands touching and loosening the timbers that pinned me. A man's voice said, Don't give up, I'm trying to free you. Keep moving. See the light coming through that opening, crawl towards it and try to get out. By the time I got out, the ruins were on fire. This meant that most of my classmates, who were with me in the same room, were burned alive. A soldier ordered me and a few surviving girls to escape to the nearby hills. I turned around and saw the outside world. Although it was morning, it looked like twilight because of the dust and smoke in the air. People at a distance saw the mushroom cloud and heard a thunderous roar. But I did not see the cloud because I was in it. I did not hear the roar, just the deadly silence broken only by the groans of the injured. Streams of stunned people were slowly shuffling from the city centre toward nearby hills. They were naked or tattered, burned, blackened and swollen. Eyes were swollen shut and some had eyeballs hanging out of their sockets. They were bleeding, ghostly figures, like a slow-motion image from an old silent movie. Many held their hands above the level of their hearts to lessen the throbbing pain of their burns. Strips of skin and flesh hung like ribbons from their bones. Often these ghostly figures would collapse in heaps to never rise again. With a few surviving classmates, I joined the procession, carefully stepping over the dead and dying. At the foot of the hill was an army training ground about the size of two football fields. Literally, every bit of it was covered with injured and dying who were desperately begging, often in faint whispers. Water, water, please give me water. But we had no containers to carry water. We went to a nearby stream to wash the blood and dirt from our bodies. Then we tore off parts of our clothes, soaked them with water, and we hurried back to hold them to the mouths of the dying who desperately sucked the moisture. We kept busy at this task of giving some comfort to the dying all day. There were no medical supplies of any kind, and we did not see any doctor or nurse. When darkness fell, we sat on the hillside, numbed by the massive scale of death and suffering we had witnessed, watching the entire city burn. In the background were the low, rhythmic whispers from the swollen lips of the ghostly figures, still begging for water. In the centre of the city were some 7,000 to 8,000 students from grades 7 and 8 who had been mobilised from all the high schools in the city to help clear fire lanes. Out in the open, close to the explosion, which was about 1 million degrees at the centre of the explosion, nearly all of them were incinerated and vaporised without a trace, and more died within days. In this way, my age group in the city was almost wiped out. <laughs> 
My sister-in-law was a teacher supervising her students at this task. Although my father and I searched for days, turning over dead and burned bodies, we never found her body. She left two little children as orphans. Others were terribly burned, but lived for several days or weeks. My sister and her four-year-old son were crossing a bridge at the moment of the explosion, and both were horribly burned, blackened and swollen beyond recognition. We could later recognise my sister only by her voice and a unique hairpin in her hair. They lingered for several days without medical care of any kind, until death at last released them from their agony. The image of my little nephew, E.G., representing the innocent children of the world, compels and drives me to continue to speak of Hiroshima, no matter how painful it may be. Soldiers threw their bodies in a ditch, poured on gasoline and threw a lighted match. They turned the bodies with bamboo poles, saying, The stomach is not burned yet, the head is only half burned. There was I, a thirteen-year-old girl, standing with my parents, witnessing the most grotesque violation of human dignity on my sister and little nephew, with no tears or other appropriate emotional response. A friend of mine, Miss Sazaki, later told me of returning the next day to where her home had stood, and finding the skeletons of her entire family, and not being able to shed any tears. The memories of this kind of behaviour troubled me for many years until I studied the psychological reaction to massive trauma. The unique and mysterious effect of the atomic bomb was radiation which affected many people. For example, my favourite uncle and aunt were in the suburbs and had no external injuries. But a couple of weeks later, they began feeling sick with the appearance of purple spots on their bodies, nausea and loss of hair and so forth. We did not know then that the sickness was due to radiation. According to my mother, who cared for them until their deaths, their internal organs seemed to be rotting and dissolving and coming out in a black liquid. Later we were told that if purple spots appeared on our bodies, this was a sure sign that we would soon die. Every morning our routine was anxiously to examine our bodies for the dreaded purple spots. I know that's difficult to hear, and it's difficult for me to read as well. But I think it's so, so important that we remember what the consequences of dropping a nuclear weapon are. That we remember what this kind of conflict would mean for innocent civilians. Because they are the ones who are affected. Not the leaders. The innocent civilians. So, whenever anyone is out there willing to stoke the fires of war and say, yes, we'll bomb them back to the Stone Age, we'll nuclear bomb them and that will make everything better and I think they should have to read that first so that they know what the consequences of those actions are only those at the very centre of the blast can hope for a quick death for everyone else a slow painful suffering due to the horrific burns or radiation poisoning when working on the first atomic bombs a physicist, Louis Slotin was performing a type of experiment called Tickling the Dragon. In these experiments, the plutonium core of an atomic bomb is brought close to critical reactivity, and then brought back from the brink. Now, Slotin was a bit of a showman, and he'd done this experiment 10, 12, 15 times before, so he liked to show to people you know, his abilities in this experiment. And uh, the only thing that kept the plutonium core apart was the head of a screwdriver. Well, one day he was doing it, and his hand slipped... He saw a blue flash and a burst of bright radiation. He instinctively dropped the core and threw half of it across the room, but it was too late. He'd already been irradiated by a fatal dose of neutron radiation. A few milliseconds was all that it took. Slotin's quick-thinking actions with throwing the core across the room may have saved the others who were in the room with him, but it didn't save him. Over the next nine days, Slotin suffered an agonising sequence of radiation-induced traumas including severe diarrhoea, reduced urine output, swollen hands, massive blisters on his hands and forearms, intestinal paralysis and gangrene. He had internal radiation burns throughout his body, which one medical expert described as three-dimensional sunburn. By the seventh day, he was experiencing periods of mental confusion. His lips and fingernails turned blue and he was put in an oxygen tent. He ultimately experienced a total disintegration of bodily functions and slipped into a coma. He died. He was the second victim of the same core. Others in the room would later die prematurely of cancer and some were badly injured in the accident. 
Particularly dangerous in terms of fallout, strontium-90 has a radioactive half-life of 29.1 years. The half-life of a radioactive material is the amount of time that it takes for half of that material to decay. So, if it has a half-life of 29.1 years, then 30 years later, it's still almost as dangerous as it was at the start. And obviously you can imagine that for it to be reduced to safe levels could take hundreds of years. But the real issue with strontium-90 is that it actually looks a lot like calcium. It's absorbed easily by plants and animals, and mimics calcium in the human body. That means that it accumulates in our bones and causes leukaemia. It can contaminate agricultural land for generations. Any food grown on a post-nuclear planet would carry the terrible risk of fallout with it. Now imagine this kind of medical crisis extending to thousands of people in every major city of the country you live in. As firestorms spread, a thousand times more energy would be released in the burning of the cities than in the nuclear weapons themselves, which are already hundreds of times more powerful than the ones dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That's the kind of situation we'd be dealing with. Safety issues have dogged nuclear weapons from the very start of their development right to the present day. In his excellent book Command and Control, which is a comprehensive history of nuclear weapons and nuclear errors, Eric Schlosser describes how the US military dealt with one of the first atomic bombs. Quote, Donald Hornig was instructed to babysit the bomb. At 9pm, Hornig climbed to the top of the 100-foot tower as the rain began to fall. He brought a collection of humorous essays. But his reading was interrupted by the arrival of a violent electrical storm. Atop the tower, in a flimsy metal shed, Hornig sat alone with the book, the fully armed device, the telephone, and a single light bulb dangling from a wire. He was 25 years old and had recently earned a PhD from Harvard. Having designed the X unit that triggered the warhead, he knew better than anyone how easily it could be triggered by static electricity. Whenever he saw a lightning bolt, he'd count the seconds until he heard the thunder. Some of the lightning fell awfully close. End quote. The Air Force listed 87 accidents that could have affected nuclear weapons between 1950 and 1957. The Army and the Navy didn't even keep track of the nuclear accidents. In several cases, nuclear weapons actually detonated, except luckily they didn't contain their plutonium cores, so only the preliminary explosion that would have set off the nuclear reaction occurred. This happened in 1950, as a bomb was dumped from a crashing B-36 bomber. On at least four occasions, these detonators fired when the weapons were dropped on removal from aircraft. The carts that used to carry nuclear bombs would break and roll away. In one case, they were perilously close to falling off a steep embankment. Even dropping a nuclear weapon could cause some types of weapon to explode if they had been accidentally armed. A B-29 crash containing a nuclear weapon, luckily without a core, which later detonated in the resulting fire. In one incident... A plane crashed into a storage container containing several nuclear bombs. It sprayed jet fuel everywhere, which quickly ignited. Bomb disposal experts described it as a miracle that one of the explosions wasn't triggered. There are dozens of stories like this from the history of nuclear weapons. We know about most of the US ones. The Soviet ones are less well known to us. And this is just the stuff that has been declassified. As we mentioned, the petrol story took years to come out, and the 1961 Goldsboro crash that we mentioned earlier... That only emerged four years ago. The army did have safety guidelines. For example, they aimed, and remember this is just an aspiration, to reduce the chances of a hydrogen bomb exploding accidentally to just 1 in 10 million. Now, you might think this actually sounds like an acceptable risk. The price of freedom, maybe. Until you realise that this means that if 10,000 hydrogen bombs were stored for a decade, then the odds of detonation would be 1 in 10,000. And if the bombs were removed from storage and flown in airplanes, as they regularly were, as we know, the odds increase to one in five. That's the upper limit. That's the aim for safety, one in five. When the US and Soviet nuclear arsenals and the readiness to respond depended on these planes, it was a miracle that there wasn't a nuclear error. Well, of course, as you would expect for number one on our list of Teot Wauwkees, this has been particularly cheerful. Next episode, we'll continue our story of nuclear weapons, and we'll talk about the strategies that humans have developed to try and deal with these new deadly weapons. We'll talk about where we are today with nuclear weapon safety, 
and perhaps the time when nuclear war came closest to happening, the Cuban Missile Crisis. I hope you've enjoyed this episode, if enjoyed is indeed the right word. We're getting towards the end of our Teotihuacan specials, at least in terms of the countdown. There's lots of interesting stuff about failed predictions, alien attacks, and the psychology of nuclear weapons and the end of the world that I want to talk about in future episodes, so we're going to continue on this for a little bit longer. In the meantime, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, hit us up on Twitter at PhysicsPod. I've been putting the scripts from old episodes up on Medium, uh, which is a blogging website, I suppose. You can access that via Twitter. Also on our Twitter, you'll find a link to the PayPal donations. This is all done completely for free, as you know, and uh, we have hosting costs, and I spend my time doing it and read lots of books and so on. Although it's fascinating, if you want to thank me for the free entertainment that you've got, that would be a lovely way to do it. And if you don't want to thank me like that, the best thing you can do is tell as many of your friends as you possibly can about this show and the dangers of the end of the world. Uh, I'll be with you in a fortnight. Until then, stay safe. You better make some preparations There's no time for hesitations Compile a list of tips Our theme music is Get Ready for the Apocalypse by Astrometrics. <laughs>